Hello, good evening, everybody. Can people hear me all right in the back? Great. Um, my name is Sarah Delicate. I'm with United Shoreline Ontario. Um, we are a grassroots volunteer organization that formed in 2017 and is entirely about high water levels. Um, we are partners with United Shoreline in New York, as well as Save Our Sodas and uh, the Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Alliance. Um, there are a lot of people paying a lot of attention to this issue these days. Now, um, as was mentioned by the mayor, I have an incredible ability to talk. I could talk to you for half a day on this topic. In fact, I have. I have 15 minutes to explain a very complex system which means I'm not going to do it justice. Um, so I would like to invite you. There will be a United Shoreline High Water Talk or High Water Rally in Brighton on February 3rd at the, not Brighton, sorry, um, Brockville. Brockville, February 3rd at the Arts Centre. Um, there is also an event being planned for Picton area um, that will be announced shortly. And in those um, sessions, I have almost an hour to share information. And I know that feels like a long time, but I do my very best to be entertaining. And the reason it's extremely important that everybody in this room understand what we're talking about when we talk about Plan 2014 is because this isn't going to change unless you make your voice heard. So we need you writing letters. You've got to write the Prime Minister, you need to write the Premier, you need to write the relevant ministers, etc. I have a handout up here um, that will actually, that has all of the contact information. And the reason for that is I have gone and met with many elected officials, many, many elected officials, and way too often I hear, I haven't heard from anyone. I haven't heard from anyone. And if they don't hear from you, there is no problem. There is no problem. I wanted to pull my hair out at the Prime Minister's office when I heard that they hardly hear anything about this, right? And the truth is, is it's a non-issue unless they hear from you. And even if you don't get a response back, because I'll hear that from people, well, I wrote, they didn't let me know. Believe me, they're, they're hearing from you. We need your voice. So, United Shoreline Ontario, part of our focus of really two major things we focus on. One is emergency preparedness and response because the water is coming. The water is coming. The second thing is on plan 2014. Now, this is my home. I live in Bowmanville, Ontario. I live there with my two daughters. I'm a single mom. What you're seeing in this video and I don't know if we can mute that, because it doesn't add a lot to sound, just distraction. Um, in 2017, absolutely nobody knew how to fight this flood. It was a surprise. How many of you knew this was coming and you were well prepared? Okay. So, New York had declared a state of emergency. New York had declared a state of emergency. And, um, can we make the video play, though? Without, Without the sound. Yeah. So, um... And we called, we called our, our fire department and, and the mayor and other places and said, what are we going to do? And we had no idea. And in 2017, um, we all scrambled to fill sandbags. Uh, the, salt, the sand that we had was road sand, so it was salted and contaminated many water wells and killed trees and so on. And um, we didn't know how to build the walls. They were built wrong. So residents did absolutely everything they could in building the walls. We built them too close, we built them like a brick wall, and the lake laughed at them. So what you're seeing in this video is our emergency responders in their full bunker gear, no harnesses, no life jackets, coming into these waters to recover sandbags because there were no other bags and they needed to be redeployed. It was extraordinarily dangerous. And what we learned is that if you don't build them right the first time, you put everybody in harm's way. You put life in harm's way and property in harm's way. Our evacuation route was compromised. Um, even in 2019, we had a new homeowner come in who bought the house in 2018. Yeah. And um, they didn't know how to build the walls. And they built it wrong. And the water took over, took out their foundation. And that family's been out of their home for over nine months, four children. All right? So this is, this is where we're from. 
Uh, United Shoreline Ontario, we have many learning videos on YouTube, uh, all of the information for writing your elected officials. We also have a social vulnerability survey. And please, please, please go online. There are two surveys we need you to fill out. One is the GLAM Committee, the Gl uh, Great Lakes Adaptive Management Committee. It's from the International Joint Commission. They want to hear from you so that they can hear that they have to adapt the plan, Plan 2014. We are doing a social vulnerability survey, and the reason for it is that we are going to Premier Ford and saying you've got to get resources to the local level, because Plan 2014 has brought the waters to your municipality and they did not receive additional dollars to fight it. So many communities have volunteer fire departments that do not have the capacity to come out and help people build walls. They don't have the capacity. My property is only 50 foot, 2,000 sandbags. 60, 30 to 60 pounds each. I've got about 120,000 pounds of sand in my backyard. I'm five foot two and, and weigh 115 pounds, right? We can't do it on our own. But one of the things we hear all the time is that we are the Richies living the California lifestyle on the waterfront. Can somebody, like who are the Richies in the room please? <laughs> Because I'm, I'm, I'm single and I'm looking for... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you must be able to lift 60 pounds. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about Plan 2014 because it's why we are here, or why I'm here anyways. Number one, Plan 2014 did not cause the flooding. It's extremely important that we stop saying that Plan 2014 is the cause. It's not the cause. Plan 2014 made it worse. It didn't bring the water, all right? So it extends the length of the flooding and it makes the water higher. Two, yes, we received record rains. Yes, there was epic snow. Yes, Lake Erie is at record highs. All of that is true and all of that is inflow. Plan 2014 is not an inflow plan, it's an outflow plan. So we're forestalling. Yes, there's lots of water, let's stop talking about that. We want to talk about what you're doing with the water once it's in the system. Plan 2014 is an outflow plan. Three, there is no magical plan that will stop all flooding. It doesn't exist. You are going to flood. In fact, in 2017 and 2019, most of us would have had some flooding, right? There's no magical plan that would have stopped it. So that's got to be part of our narrative as well. And number four, one of the things that we're hearing a lot is that the IJC has been deviating from Plan 2014 for over a year? Not true. Not true. The IJC um, only granted permission for deviation on November, um, I believe it was 19th, of 2019. So, and even then we didn't start deviating. They didn't deviate until shipping was closed at the end of December. We started true deviation January 1st for a couple of weeks until we needed to close the dams again for ice formation. So we have been operating under Plan 2014. Now the good news is, is that coming into spring, we have full authority to deviate. So let's see what happens. This is what this looks like. Plan 1958DD was the old plan, the plan that um, managed the lakes for over 50 years. We built our policies, our setbacks, all of that stuff was built on this plan. So what you see here, and I know it's probably very difficult for those of you in the back, and that's why you're going to come to Brockville and see it on a <laughs> giant screen and have it, have it completely explained to you. The top gray line is the flood line. That's the high water line. The bottom is the drought line. Plan 20, 1958 DD managed it to a four foot range. Now you can see there's, we, we didn't always do it. They weren't, it wasn't always successful, but they did a great job. Plan 2014 wants higher highs and lower lows by design. Now the pamphlet on this will tell you it's about wetlands, but it's not just about wetlands. Um, and again, I can't get into all of that today, but we actually end up with 400% more high water events under Plan 2014 than Plan 1958DD by design. So we went from a four foot range to a seven foot range in the plan. And this is it still water. So if you take uh, this kind of extra water and then throw in two feet, three feet, four feet waves, we're in trouble, okay? 
So there are three things that you need to understand about Plan 2014. Trigger levels, F limits, and L limits. And this is why it takes me an hour to tell this story. You're going to get it in like a minute. Okay? But it's complicated. The first thing is trigger levels. These trigger levels did not exist in the old plan. And what you have here, the, the diamonds across the top here, there's these little, this black line, that blue line is a high water mark. So these black diamonds represent um, the uh, monthly maximum highest level that we, they, they want. It, right, that, that's not good, none of that's good. But this red line with the dots are, is called the trigger level. And under Plan 2014, Lake Ontario has to reach above that trigger level before they will deviate from Plan 2014. Now, what you need to notice is how close the red line is to those black diamonds, right? It's like taking a tractor trailer going 130 kilometers an hour and asking it to stop 10 feet from a red light. That's what these trigger levels do. Because by the time we have reached that level, we cannot let the water out fast enough. We can't solve the problem. Because one inch out of Lake Ontario is 11 inches downstream in Montreal. So if you open the dam here to start bringing this water down, you're flooding out Montreal. So the plan in its, in its design with trigger levels causes an incredible difficulty, okay? so. Um, trigger levels didn't exist under Plan 1958 DD. It is the shipping industry that requested the trigger levels. Second thing we need to understand, the F limit. So the F limit is ultimately about balancing downstream and upstream interests. So, because of course Montreal is downstream, right? And we built this dam that now allows more water to go out than it did before the dam, pre-project. We would have flooded worse if that dam wasn't there. That is true, all right? So we do derive some benefit from that dam. But how much benefit are we deriving compared to other stakeholders? That's the question. This is a balance question. So what happens is there is, under this plan, um, it's called it the upper trigger level, which is the shared pain point. When we hit that blue line, the pain in Quebec and the pain in Ontario is roughly the same, okay? The problem is, is Plan 2014 has a hard stop at this blue line. So the orange line that goes way up, that's Lake Ontario. And this orange line is what's happening downstream in Montreal, all right? So as we go along, go along in May, all of a sudden, Montreal starts getting in trouble and they hit that blue line and it's a hard stop, we close the dam. You following? Okay. On this side is what would it have looked like if there was no F limit? If we didn't worry about Montreal and we just let the water flow, we took away the limit, what you, you see a complete inverse. So Lake Ontario doesn't even reach the blue flood line. We don't even hit that line, but Montreal goes way above. Okay. Now the reason that Montreal was flooding was because of the Ottawa River. The Ottawa River is completely downstream. It's entirely in Canada. It's not a tributary to Lake Ontario. Yet a foot and a half of our water this year in 2019, sorry, was due to the F limit. So we took an extra foot and a half because of the Ottawa River. Now, is a shared pain point, um, does it make sense? And the answer is yes. We are not advocating that we get rid of this and to hell with Montreal. Okay? <laughs> but it has to be balanced. It has to be balanced. We have a hard stop for Montreal, but no, there's no, we want an S limit, a shoreline limit built into Plan 2014 that says that once Lake Ontario has hit this level, you need to start redistributing. Because under this plan right now, Lake Ontario will rise, 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 rise. Now, the water can move out of um, Montreal, which has happened, right? The water goes down. See, I'm already almost out of time. The water goes down, and the next limit kicks in, unfortunately, which is called the L limit. And the L limit is about protecting the safety of shipping, okay? Because when you let too much water out of the dam, the velocity gets too high and ships are now not safe. So what you see, now there's a very important concept called uh, criterion H14. 
And what that it says is that when you hit criteria H14, Lake Ontario water levels, when they reach or exceed these high levels, the works in the international rapid section shall be operated to provide all possible relief to riparian owners upstream and downstream. All possible relief. It doesn't say here, except for if shipping interests need to be considered or hydro or somebody else. It's a, it's a full stop. There's no carve out for any other interests. But what we're seeing instead is this blue line is that criteria on H14. Lake Ontario level crossed this in 2019, May 9th, and we way surpassed it. So this level here, the dark blue that's all jagged, that is the outflow out of the Moses Saunders Dam. So we dropped the outflow because of the L limit right, for, sorry, F limit for Montreal, right? So then we start coming back up, coming back up, but then we stop. We stop, why don't we keep letting water out? Because we can. we can, we can let a lot more water out. So when the IJC says we're letting out the maximum amount, no, they're letting out the maximum amount permissible, not the maximum amount possible. There's a distinction. So under this limit, that's the maximum amount. Now what they gave us was an extra 200 cubic meters uh, cubed per second, which is a 3% extra deviation. It was helpful, but can you imagine what Lake Ontario would have actually looked like if we didn't have an L limit, right? So what happens is that we release, 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 and then it's a hard stop. And that hard stop was in place until December 31st of this year. Trigger limits. L limits, F limits. All right, so here's the forecast that we've also been given. And, you know, conservation authorities are given this forecast as well. And it's really hard to read this thing, and it's not really a forecast, it's more of a range. But what we see is that we've got this 5% chance that we're going to see water levels like we did last year. Um, and, you know, 5% chance of drought, and the average kind of just keeps us kicking along. The problem with this forecast is it is based on data for 119 years, I believe. So this probabilistic forecast is produced primarily from historical water supplies, 1900 to 2018. So given any year in that 100 year span, what would be the likelihood of something like this happening? But the IGC has another document, a probabilistic, a, a transition matrix of probability. And what it says is that if you have a very wet year one year, what's the probability that it's going to be very wet the next year? What does it say? 63%. So how can we possibly say we have a 5% chance of repeat, right? So, and, and we all see where this is going anyways. This is my last slide. So, Bernie Gigas is the engineer who puts all of this work together. He has spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours just ripping all of the raw data apart, all right? And we have presented all of this data to the International Joint Commission because we do not want to present data that isn't bulletproof, okay? So this has gone in front of the Canadian chair, the American chair, and 15 of their highest level engineers and policy advisors. So in 2017, we started the year in January 1st at 244 feet, 0.36. And we took an extra 4.59 wa feet of water. This isn't just inflow. This is also F limit, L limit, and trigger levels, okay? We ended up taking on an extra 4.59 feet. We started 2018 at 245.28, so even higher, but guess what? We actually didn't have a wet year we didn't have a wet year, so there was no F limit, no trigger levels, no L limits, and we only took 1.44, which is more normal. Two to three feet is normal. Problem is, we started the next year high again, 2019, 245 feet. We had F limit, L limit, a dam break in Quebec, and here we took on 3.74 feet, which took us to our highest level ever. We have started January even higher. This was a forecast done in June. We, we, even, we started even higher, 246.1, I believe, is where we started January. All we need to do 
is have a repeat of 2017 or 2019, and we are pushing 250 feet, which is a foot higher than we were in 2019. I know nobody likes that part, okay? So what are our asks? United Shoreline Ontario is asking, number one, for equitable representation for Ontario on the control board. Premier Ford has also written this letter. There are three Canadian chairs. Two of them are downstream. One is from Montreal. There is the um, International Lake or um, ILO SLRB that controls the dam. has one Ontario member and I believe six or seven Quebec members. Okay? We're, it's unbalanced. We are not represented. Number two, the, the IJC revoke the unbalanced policy plans of Plan 2014 that both worsen and extend the flooding and replace them with truly balanced policy that distributes injury and benefit fairly to all stakeholders. Three, the conservation authorities urgently streamline their processes and policies to enable homeowners to do what is necessary to effectively protect, restore their safety, their homes and property from flooding. Yeah. No, but believe me, um, it's different all over. It depends on your conservation authority. It's, 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 there's no standard kind of approach. Four, a provincial standard for municipal emergency flood response with the required provincial fun, uh, funding and resources to support it. In Clarington, our emergency responders pulled out all stops, all stops. We have over 100 people signed up on a flood brigade that's on rapid notify. Um, we have, they brought in four um, nonprofit organizations, ADRA, St. John Ambulance, I, I can't remember the other two. High schools were recruited to build bags. We deployed tens of thousands of bags in partnership with the community. So we have a community organization, extremely well organized, and together we, we protected our community. But then you go to other places where they don't even get sand and bags. You're entirely on your own, right? It, but we're all the same taxpayer. But let's be clear, this water has, so to protect the safety of shipping, the risk has been brought to you. And I can tell you that your municipality has not received any additional money to be ready for that. So the last ask is, for, sorry, number four, is that there be money assigned to the municipality to actually help, to actually, like many communities, they're volunteer fire departments, right? How do you do this? So anyways, I've gone way over. Thank you so much for your uh, time.